Hello and welcome. My name is Al Carver Kubik. I am a research scientist here at Image Permanence Institute. Thank you so much for attending our webinar, Sustainable Preservation, Quick Tips and Approaches for Museums, Libraries, and Archives. Here at IPI, we have created a sustainability committee. This is our very first community initiative hosted by our group. We believe that each of us has the power to take steps towards becoming more environmentally sustainable in our cultural heritage institutions and in the preservation of our collections. Achieving sustainability and preservation requires active participation and community. So we invite you to submit questions as well as your own tips and ideas in the Q&A box. We will group the questions and ask them at the end of the program. We will also collect the tips that you provide here as well as the tips you provided in the program registration and send them out to you when, when they're all compiled. We're also very interested in where you are in your journey towards sustainability. So I'm going to put up a poll here and please take a minute or two to answer these sort of very short poll questions. And I'll keep going with the introduction while you answer the poll questions. So here, here we are, I've launched the poll. Um, and I believe there's just three questions there. So go ahead and uh, put in put in your answers. So as I said, this program is organized by Image Permanence Institute. We are an academic research center at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and we're dedicated to supporting the preservation of cultural heritage collections and libraries, archives, and museums around the world. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Our speakers all have lots of experience implementing sustainable practices and in collecting institutions. First, we have Sarah Sutton. Sarah is a museum professional consulting on sustainability for the cultural sector, and she will provide a big picture, big picture perspective. Next will be Angela Moore. As sustainability coordinator, she will share facility-wide perspective um, from sort of a multifaceted collecting institution. Kelly Krish has tips relating to collection environment. And finally, William Shelley will provide tips for the conservation lab. So at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to Sarah, who will share her ideas and perspectives. And I'll close this poll um, maybe at the two minute mark here, so like 30 seconds. All right. Thanks, Al. Hello, everyone. So glad you could join us. It's quite a big group. I'm delighted to see all of this interest. So I'll give you my three as a summary and then go through them all. They are let go of the guilt. It interferes with progress. Lead with your passions and your strengths and to talk about climate change, to make it normal and make it important. So for letting go of the guilt, because it interferes with progress, there is so much to be done and so many different ways to do it, that the guilt around the limitations or even personal preferences or the angst about correct choices can be overwhelming and defeating. So instead, focus on what you can comfortably and confidently control and allow each step in this work to help you build your capacity to do more. You're going to encounter some great ideas today and you won't be able to do them all. That is okay. Let go of the ones that are not available to you right now and focus on those that catch your interest and are something you can start with. So for the true confessions part of today, I eat red meat. I eat red meat because I live with a 27 year old carnivore and I expect him to pay rent and to cook half of the meals. He cooks meat. Now I could have an argument every evening about whether or not we're eating meat, or I could appreciate that he's doing this work and the fact that the two of us together garden on our property and grow all of our vegetables and raise the eggs that we eat. So that's the aspect I focus on. I also fly twice a year to climate meetings. That's a lot of carbon that I put in the atmosphere to help people reduce carbon. So it doesn't seem like a very good plan. But I don't keep rethinking that choice because I know that the guilt about it would interfere with doing the bigger things that are important to me and where I have the most ability to create a difference. 
I've even called and spoken to Bob James, um, the Canadian social responsibility leader for the museum sector, because he doesn't fly anywhere and he hasn't for years. And I called him sort of as a confessor to talk about, you know, how is it okay that I do this? And when we talked about what both of us do, we agreed that his work really can be done only from home and that my work has to be done out in the field with other colleagues and with people from other nations. And I know that if I didn't use air travel, I wouldn't be in a position to help cultural institutions advocate for the ambitious climate target that President Biden just sent, set last week. So on Earth Day, when the White House press release came out about how they announced this goal of 50 to 52% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, they said they had confidence to set that goal for 2030 because of a whole host of subnational actors that had been doing this work for the last four years. And when they wrote that press release, they mentioned specifically cultural institutions. That was a really big day in my office. And if I'd been feeling too guilty to fly to Madrid in 2019 and be part of those discussions at the UN climate meeting, I know that I couldn't have had that sort of influence that would move our sector forward. Because if we want to get funded to reduce emissions, we have to be part of the solution. We needed to be part of that number. So lead with your passions and your strengths. Let go of the guilt and do what you can do. Nurturing the change that you're passionate about will create the break breakthroughs that other people need to be able to do things that are too hard for them. So if something is driving you crazy, notice how you and others use that material or do that work or perform that practice and figure out what's the thing that makes it stuck, that keeps it from happening the way you want it to and see if you can shift something there. So for example, if you're the one who knows what the green solvents are in your lab and no one else is using them, it might be because they're afraid to ask you again, which one is the right one. And maybe you're afraid to say it out loud again. So what would be a different way to switch that? What if you set up a section of the storage supply cabinet that has a green um, paint background to it or a green label on it? And it directs people easily to find the greener things in your lab. That's one way to make it easier for others to do something that you care about strongly. So there are great stories of passionate people doing this work. There's Sarah Nunberg, my friend and colleague, who's driven the whole life cycle assessment project that's being funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And she's passionate about using life cycle assessment so that conservators can make good choices, well-informed choices, about which items have the most or least impact when they care for collections. And then there's Angela on today's panel. She is fierce about building energy management. And that matters because we need a champion who can do that work and who's so generous with her time in helping to develop those standards and how they apply with museums. So these are remarkable, passionate people and they're paving the way for others. So be that person when you can and follow those who are doing it for you. And then thirdly, talk about climate change. When I say talk about climate change, I mean, ask in your museum, what are we doing? Are we benchmarking energy? Are we creating a preferred purchases, purchases list for the things that we do? Do we have a green materials list for our exhibitions? What are the things that we do about climate change that matter to us? Make sure that your leadership and your peers know that this is something that matters to the profession. Because if they aren't on top of it, they will soon find themselves explaining why they haven't kept up, kept up with professional practice. You see, the thing about talking about climate change is that the more we do it, the more others realize it's a thing you can do and you should do. It's not troublesome, it's not troublemaking, it's important. However, we have to be careful these days when we talk about climate change. A lot of people are telling us what we have to do as an individual, what we have to give up, what we have to cut back on. As if major manufacturers who create autos, auto manufacturers and shampoo manufacturers have nothing to do with the decisions we make. It matters that each of us creates change, but it matters more when more of us do it together. 
So having this conversation today about what we can all do for collective action will make even a bigger difference than each of us making our own decisions. So it matters that we talk about climate change. We matter, it matters that people catch us doing green things so that they know to copy that practice or they know that it's an okay practice. But sometimes I can bet that you'll get tired for being the green one in your lab or your museum or your library. And you'll think to yourself, really, do I have to take this stuff out of the garbage bin and put it in the recycling bin again? Or really, we've asked these folks to purchase this stuff and they keep forgetting and buying the other things. Yes, if you can that day, you do have to take the stuff out of the garbage and put it in the recycling bin or give someone another copy of a preferred purchases list or go ahead and do a little bit more research. If you can, you should do it. But on those days that you feel like you can't and you wanna give up, I wanna tell you to call me. That's one thing you can do. And I am gonna give you my telephone number. It's on Pacific time. So uh, that's Greenwich Mean Time minus seven. It's 978-505-4515. And when you feel like you need a little boost, you call and I will cheer you on. And it may be that someday I will need a boost too. And I will call you back. And together, sharing ideas, cheering each other on, we will be able to change the field. And that will make a big difference. So there you go. My three tips for the day. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah. You always inspire me. Next up is Angela Moore, and I'm going to share our poll results while Angela gets set up here. Um, so go ahead when you're ready, Angela. Okay. I'm going to get my presentation going here. Okay. Thank you so much, Al and Sarah, you set it up nicely for me to talk about uh, organizational practices. Um, I am with the Missouri Historical Society. It's comprised of three different uh, organizations. It's the Missouri History Museum, which is the picture um, on the screen now. Um, we have a library and research center it is um, where we have a library and um, the majority of our collections. And then we have Soldiers Memorial Military Museum, which is a museum um, downtown St. Louis. And um, that museum is owned by the city of St. Louis, but the Missouri Historical Society, we are the operators. And so I'm gonna offer some organizational tips on how to become more green. Um, and my first tip is to understand the needs of your organization instead of the wants. Um, when I give presentations, a lot of people ask, well, where should I start? Should I start with recycling? Should I add solar panels? And I always tell them, um, stop for a minute and understand what is it that your organization can do to have a greater impact on reducing climate change because it may not come from solar panels and it may not come from a recycling program. So um, you have to understand where is it that your organization can have the greatest impact in, our, in your community. Would it be obtaining green building certifications or will it be um, implementing internal sustainability practices? Um, from my experience and greening all three of these organizations and um, getting them to lead certification, I have learned that you have to have a holistic approach to, um, cli to climate change and helping your organization to be green. But not only that, have a look at it from a cause and effect. I know a lot of organizations say, well, we're going to put our temperatures at this level and we're gonna set our building automation system here so that it will have the least amount of energy usage. But when you're talking about climate change and implementing um, practices internally, understand that every cause has an effect. Um, so if you create that set point with a building automation system, how that has a relative temperature, rel uh, uh, temperature at a certain level, relative humidity level, or if you're increasing airflow or your CFMs, 
how will this impact collections? And that's usually one of my first um, questions I ask myself, how does this impact our collections across all three of our locations? How does this impact the comfort level, not only of um, staff, but visitors? And then what about energy conservation? Um, how is this going to improve energy conservation? And so you have to really understand what the needs of your organization is and have a realistic approach towards climate change. But not only that, but that holistic approach comes from making sure that you implement sustainability practices, just not for the benefit of collections, but for the benefit of housekeeping, for the benefit of guest services, for the benefit of visitors. So um, that is the first tip is you want to really understand what is the need of your organization. And you find that out by um, understanding what each division, department and role in your organization does and how they can contribute to helping to combat climate change. The second tip that I have, if I can get my slide going. Okay, and the second tip that I have is green the building. This is our other location. This is the Librarian Research Center. And what do I mean by green the building? Um, one of the best methods to combat climate change in the museum field is to green the building first. And the reason why I say that is if you look at statistics um, for buildings and their greenhouse gas emissions globally, Buildings generate nearly 40% of annual global greenhouse gases, and 28% of the 40% comes from building operations. So the building sector has a large impact, and it comes from us just operating our buildings, whether we welcome in visitors or not, whether our sites are just collecting sites. So that's 28% of um, greenhouse gases, global greenhouse gases of emissions with just buildings. And when you look at that in comparison to um, the global transportation sector, the global transportation sector have 23% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. That's, so our buildings itself is contributing more than the transportation sector globally. And so that's why I say it's important to green your building first and that statistic, if you want to know a little more about statistics for um, climate change and building relations, that's from the Global Alliance of um, Buildings and Construction, which is the 2018 Global Status Report. But if we look at the impact of organizations and buildings, that mean we're greening our buildings inside and out, but, but how does an organization do that, right? Um, I spoke about LEAD, that's one of the ways that we do that. And LEAD is the acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. I have to note that's not the only green practice that we have. We have a large number of green practices, but LEAD makes up about 75% of our green initiatives and tasks that we do for greening the Missouri Historical Society. But what can you do if you're not going for a LEAD certified project? Um, I know this one is an eye roll up for me each and every time, but uh, I always say LED lights. That is a low hanging fruit. Most people can achieve that. Usually there is incentive programs out there with your energy company for you to um, do a LED light project. Um, prior to me coming on at the Missouri Historical Society, they did an organizational wide um, LED project. And I benchmarked um, their energy use prior to the LED project. And then I benchmarked their use um, a year after the LED project. And it was astounding. They saved 3% in energy use just from changing out LED lights at this library and research center location. Majority, and they did that. And the majority of the lights were in the collections areas. So, that's one of the ways. And then look into automatic fixtures, automatic light fixtures, automatic water fish fixtures. Um, a lot of time when we think of green, we think of just energy only, but now we have to think about water as well. 
What about demand response systems? Um, reach out to your energy provider, utility company. Ask about their demand response systems that you can utilize at your location. And maybe even an energy audit. Um, most energy audits are now free. Um, many municipalities are implementing benchmarking ordinances that are requiring buildings as big as um, some of our buildings to report our energy and water usage. And so in that mandate, they sometimes offer free help for benchmarking and even an energy audit. And so those are some ways that an organization can green their building um, if they're not going for a LEED certification. But the other tip in that is talk with your facility staff. When I first came to the Missouri Historical Society, um, they did not know where to put me as a sustainability professional. So they put me into facilities and that was the greatest thing that they ever could have did for me. Um, I worked with four facility technicians that had together combined over 40, over 95 years of experience in facilities. And some of the facility technicians were here before um, there was even a library and research center, before there was even a soldier's memorial military museum, before the history museum expanded. And so I got to know a lot about the building, how it operated and how I can um, green the building more effectively. And the final tip that I have is um, create an accountability me for measurements. Um, this building is our Soldiers Memorial Military Museum building. It's also LEED certified, but I have to note that um, it's also a true zero waste um, certified museum. It's the only um, building in St. Louis that has a true zero waste certification and the only museum um, in the United States to have a zero waste certification. And so from lead and zero waste, what we do is we create an accountability factor. These are two certified programs that um, are sent out for a third party review. And so although we implement the practices internally, it's sent out for a third party review and they say, okay, well, it looks, you're not greenwashing, <laughs> um, but you're actually living up to what you're, um, you're speaking with. And so create an accountability factor in your sustainability practices. Um, figure out how to put measurements to that, whether it's benchmarking energy, water, or waste, or whether it's setting SMART goals, which is the acronym for specific, measurable, obtainable, relative, and time-based goals for your organization in relationship to environmental sustainability. But always find a way to have an accountability factor so that you can hold a mirror up to your organization and you guys can hold a mirror up to yourselves and say, okay, this is where we are and this is where we would like to go. But lastly, um, um, we usually don't talk about this a lot, but when you have an accountability factor, you actually make room for funding. It leads a way for funding for you to continuously implement sustainability um, practices. And so those measurements allow you to have qualitative and quantitative data. And it also leads to further funding for you to continue to implement sustainability measures, whether it's through donations, grants, and one of my favorite um, funding opportunities is through local um, incentives. So um, those are the three tips that I have in working to green all three of those buildings for the Missouri Historical Society. Thank you so much. Um, so helpful, really. Thank you so much. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Kelly Krish, and um, take it away, Kelly. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so as Angela just covered sort of the facilities wide approach, I'm going to focus on specifically on those collections environments. 
which is an area that IPI has been working in for many years, um, both with laboratory-based research to demonstrate the feasibility of different techniques, as well as implementing the strategies at numerous institutions um, to both improve preservation as well as to do so sustainably. So I particularly like this definition of sustainability uh, or of our goal because I think it helps to frame sustainability not in terms of a sacrifice or a decision with preservation, but really shows it as part of an optimization process. And hopefully throughout today, we'll really make the case for how there's so many options that can support both preservation and sustainability, and we can get wins on both fronts. So um, in terms of what I'll cover today, these were the three tips that I'm, I'm going to be speaking about and then going into some examples of how they can be implemented in each instance. So the first tip, um, just as Angela suggested, kind of starting with this um, assessment of a facility-wide, recommend the same thing from a collections perspective, in this case being a risk assessment. Um, so that really allows us to best direct our resources to provide um, the best protection for our collections and to do so efficiently. So the reason I've included this cartoon is I think it helps to demonstrate what happens when we have a mismatch between we had a hazard present, um, but the vulnerabilities of the objects to those weren't noted. And so the same thing can happen from an environmental perspective where we can um, fail to provide adequate care or we can be focused on the wrong thing. So really starting with that risk assessment can help us to figure out where to direct those efforts. So one example specifically has to do with set points and fluctuations. I know this has been a topic of much interest for many years in the cultural heritage field. Um, sometimes we do need to expend energy in order to provide the proper conditions for our collections, but I did want to show an example of a study as well as an institutional example where they were able to take a risk-based approach and found that they could expand the parameters safely, and it resulted in very significant energy savings. So um, this is where it, you know, it's worthwhile to go through this process, even though it can seem time consuming, um, there really is a lot to be gained from it. And even in instances where the energy was saved and may not have had an effect on preservation, um, certainly there are plenty of instances too where there's even a gain in preservation. So again, very much a, a win there. And that can often happen by emphasizing opportunities where we can improve the preservation of our collections rather than trying to live up to a prescribed standard that's standardized across multiple collection types with many different needs or prioritizing flatlining rather than um, optimizing. So that's the third aspect of risk assessment. This is an example from you know, a typical continental climate where we have hot and humid summers, but then we have cooler and drier winters. Summers can be tricky when we're determining set points because in order to have lower temperatures that improve preservation by slowing the rates of chemical decay, it often costs us energy in the form of cooling and dehumidification. So we end up having to balance those two needs. Winter though represents a very good win for us because with those lower temperatures outside, we're able to take advantage of that, provide those lower temperatures inside as well and slow the rates of chemical decay and to do so without expending extra energy, reheating that air more than we need to. So whether it's, whether the outside conditions and the operation of your structure allow you to um, find sustainability options on a seasonal basis or even night versus day options, those are ones that you may wanna investigate for opportunities to improve both preservation and sustainability. Okay, so moving away from risk assessment, I also wanted to talk about microclimates. These really represent the last level of control before we get to the object. So we wanna make sure that um, they're performing as optimally as possible. And I really like them for a number of reasons. So both storage and exhibit furniture, as well as enclosures, um, have a lot to be said in terms of sustainability because oftentimes they protect against multiple forms of deterioration. So we're addressing multiple issues with a single solution, which is very efficient. 
And also when we invest in long lasting and standardized furniture and enclosures, they can be used for long periods of time, even if the operation of the mechanical system were to change, or in many cases, we may even be switching storage spaces entirely into different rooms. And that furniture and that enclosure is still going to be beneficial even in a different setting. So they can um, really represent wins. From an environmental management perspective, I wanted to share how, how they can be effective in terms of managing relative humidity. This is some data from a um, storage cabinet, but I'll say that we also have similar data from exhibit cases. And you can see here that the yellowish brown line is what's happening within the room itself. And the blue line there is representing what's happening within the storage cabinet. So it's really doing an excellent job of buffering against those increases in relative humidity as well as those fluctuations and doing so passively with no mechanical control. We see similar things for storage enclosures. Um, in this graph, the blue line represents the environment within a laboratory setting, and then the red, black, and green lines represent the performance of the different storage enclosures you see across the top. So I will say we see quite a range in terms of um, how effective different storage enclosures can be. Cardboard boxes tend not to be very effective. Portfolio cases tend to be on the uh, more effective sides. So, um, but these can be very effective means for buffering against relative humidity changes, especially for thinner objects, which tend to be more vulnerable to our changes in relative humidity and equilibrate more quickly. And then finally, I wanted to mention storage density. We usually recommend consolidating storage into as few spaces as possible for a number of reasons, but this is an example from the environmental side. The more hygroscopic materials we have in a space, the better they are able to control the environment. And so the more they can reduce the fluctuations in relative humidity, the better for the preservation of the objects themselves and the less work we have to do mechanically. So. Um, microclimates and, and storage environments can, can be very effective solutions in terms of managing the environment in passive ways. And then the final tip I wanted to cover for today is really to look at any kind of mechanical operation you have and check for inefficiencies and, op and opportunities for improvement. So even for institutions that may not have a full mechanical system, uh, often they use portable dehumidifiers or humidifiers, some type of fan, whether it might be ceiling fans, box fans, attic fans, or even window AC units. And I'll just mention that there are a number of factors, I've listed some for portable dehumidifiers specifically, that really come into play in terms of whether they will be operating as effectively as they could be. So I would encourage you to use, um, use a data monitoring system and do the experimentation to make sure that the equipment is doing what you're hoping to and that it's helping you to achieve your preservation goals in the most effective ways possible. Once we've looked at the downstream equipment, certainly the if you do have a full HVAC system, monitoring and doing data analysis on that can also be very effective to catch issues early on. Probably one of the more common ones and, and easy to see is excess heating. When we have extra heating, we're um, increasing the, the amount of chemical decay in the space and we're expending extra energy in order to heat that air. This can come from changes in set points or failures. Um, sometimes things fail on or reheats fail and we see this extra heat dumped into the space. So we wanna catch that as quickly as possible. Um, other inefficiencies are not quite as obvious. They might not be as self-announcing. So again, having the data monitoring and the data analysis in place to catch these can go a long way in terms of addressing preservation and sustainability issues. And then finally, once we have our equipment working the way we'd like it to, um, we've addressed any issues. There are a number of strategies that can be used to make the mechanical systems operate more sustainably. So I would encourage you to download the free guidebook we have available at the link listed on the page, um, and it will walk you through how to, uh, whether any of the six strategies would be good for your institution and how to go about testing those. And I was really excited to see that a number of you had mentioned a couple of these strategies within the tips that we collected during registration. So that was great to see that um, some of these are already being used. 
So I guess just to, to kind of sum up, um, these are just three tips. Um, there are many that can be used to in, in institutions for collections environments. So uh, what will work best for each institution is really dependent on the specific context, but I would encourage you to go through the same process that we, we would use for any sort of environmental management or preventive project where we collect the documentation, perform our assessment and develop an action plan to move forward. And um, hopefully you can find options that work well for you. And if there's any area that you need help in, we're happy to help, including um, we actually just started a program to loan out toolkits that can be useful for checking to see if there are heat or moisture loads in a space and what your lighting levels are. So if you're interested in that, be sure to reach out. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, next we have William. Um, Thank you. And thank you, Sarah and Angela and Kelly. This will be hard to follow uh, such great speakers, but I'll do my best. I'm going to speak on three tips. The first being glove recycling. Second being sourcing local vendors for materials. And the third being um, reusing materials whenever possible. I'm the, as Al said, I'm the lab manager for the UCLA Getty Conservation Program, and sustainability is a core value for our program. So we are committed to research and implementation of sustainable practices in conservation, and this includes recycling, waste management, energy use, and the adoption of, of green chemicals in our labs. So, the glove recycling program, uh, it's a beneficial alternative to glove disposal as it keeps the gloves out of landfills. And generally speaking, how it works, these programs work, is these companies will take the non-hazardous gloves, clean them, sort them, and then process them into plastic pellets that can then be extruded into other consumer products such as um, patio, patio furniture, for example. Currently, there are two available glove recycling programs. The first is by a company uh, called TerraCycle, and their box is Zero Waste Box. Uh, this program requires a direct purchase of their boxes. They have small, medium, and large, and they allow a huge range of materials, but the one I'll be speaking today is uh, gloves. Um, the advantage of, of this company is that none of the materials are required to be proprietary. So when I speak of the Kimberly Clark Right Cycle program, um, you have to only use Kimberly Clark uh, products in order to recycle them into their boxes. So that's uh, one advantage of the zero waste box by TerraCycle. And the way it works is you order, uh, place an order on their website or there are various other vendors uh, such as Staples and I believe even Amazon now sells them. Um, you collect, you fill up your box and then it comes with a prepaid return label. Uh, so when it's full, it gets shipped back to TerraCycle for processing. Um, now the second company is the Kimberly Clark uh, Right Cycle. And this is the program, the PPE recycling program run through Kimberly Clark Professional. So they not only recycle gloves, but also other PPE such as safety glasses and even protective clothing. Um, but again, the, the way theirs work is you have to purchase Kimberly Clark products. Um, and so if, if your institution or museum has maybe a contract with Kimberly Clark, this would be um, a great suggestion for, for your institution. Now prices for the TerraCycle, they range from $100 for a smaller box up to $400 for the larger box. Uh, the small box measures 11 inches by 11 inches by um, 24 inches, and the largest box is approximately 15 inches by 15 inches by 40 inches. Um, and the, the pricing for the Kimberly 
Clark Red Cycle, it, it requires a consultation and it's a little bit more involved. So I don't have the, the actual prices on hand. My, my second tip is to try and, and source some um, materials from local vendors. Um, and we're in Los Angeles. So these are some of the companies where uh, while they might not be a small business per se, um, they are local and they have uh, a storefront that I can go and on my way to work, I don't have to make a special trip. I don't have to have them uh, create a special packaging um, and, and I can go and, and pick it up. And being the lab manager, I am in charge of the inventory of our lab and I, I do get to see the faculty syllabus and their practicals for the students so I can go through and, and instead of maybe ordering online or having our office manager order online, I can uh, simply go to the local art store and pick up brushes or acrylic paints, um, things like that. So I do suggest um, trying to source materials locally when, when possible. Another possibility is to evaluate electronic ordering. Uh, so I know Amazon and, and various other uh, websites you can you can consolidate orders or request to use less packing materials um, so that's another way to reduce um, shipping materials and things like that my third tip is to reuse and repurpose materials whenever possible here are five examples but there's uh, plenty more out there so tyvek mylar ethyfoam pipettes and archival board Tyvek, Ethifoam, and Archival Board, you can really reuse when you're shipping objects or for our conservation program, we borrow a lot of objects from various institutions. And when we return uh, these objects, we have our students create uh, maybe custom mounts or custom uh, shipping boxes. And we may ask the institution if um, they need those boxes, if you know they might not have room as, as space is always a limiting factor for institutions. And if, if they say, no, we just wanted the box for shipping, then we can take that box and potentially reuse it in the future. And our students still get the experience of learning how to create custom, custom boxes. Um, pipettes are easily, while they're called disposable, they're easily reusable. Uh, we can label them if, if we want to use them just for uh, water-based adhesive. Uh, we can wash them out as well. So it's, it's not just a one use um, and toss for, for our program. And Mylar, a lot of people may use it for templates. Um, you, you can potentially use that again in the future for um, coating a, a metal or something like that. And archival board, there's always scraps. And for our program, while we borrow and work on large objects, we also work on small objects such as um, coins. And so small scraps can be very useful uh, in, in the future for our students to work on smaller objects. And so again, space is, is I know always a limiting factor, but we have a dedicated space for smaller scraps of all of these materials, Tyvek, Mylar, archival board that our students know they can go to and use a smaller piece rather than cutting uh, a one inch by one inch or four inch by four inch out of a, such a large sheet. So I think that wraps up my uh, three tips for, for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, at this point, I would like to open it up to questions. Um, so I will turn it over to Meredith. Um, and I also will share um, the contact information for all of our wonderful speakers. Um, they've all been wonderful and been very, very kind and generous in, in offering their time um, and their expertise. At the end of the program here, please take a minute to fill out our very, very short post webinar survey. Also, the webinar recording will be available on our website. Um, and you can also sign up for our newsletter on our website. So um, 
yeah, go ahead, Meredith, if there's any questions in the q and I'll also share the poll results again, just so everybody can, can see what how their peers are, are doing. Yeah, thank you again to all of our speakers. That was uh, really awesome. I think covered a wide range of topics at a lot of different levels, and I, I certainly learned a lot. Um, so we do have a question. Uh, someone is asking about some resources to find um, emerging research on sustainable materials, say to replace ethafoam or poly bags or other plastics um, that can be used with collections objects. Um, and really, are there are there uh, resources that you all find yourself going to to help make decisions about reducing plastics or about making more sustainable choices um, in your different inst institutions and places of work? Uh, so we're working on a project with uh, FAIC, the Foundation for American Institute for Conservation, um, that is the life cycle assessment project, which will have a tool where you could type in ethafoam and find out based on the amount you use, what its human toxic, human health toxicity and environmental impacts are and compare it to maybe an alternative. Now, spoiler alert, we're having, ethafoam has really high impacts and we're having trouble finding sufficient substitute for quality care. And some of the natural resources we're looking into, like mycelium um, foam, don't pass an audit test. So, and that is the limit of my conservation skills and abilities just there. Um, but I, I know that we're finding out more. We don't necessarily have answers, but that tool will have a, a lot of good substitute um, solutions for you. So eventually at culturalheritage.org, there will be the life cycle assessment tool, which is a user-friendly and free um, accessible tool for plugging in some simple requests about individual impacts of individual materials you might be using. Thank you. I would maybe also suggest um, the sustainability and conservation website um, that they do a lot of work specifically looking at conservation materials and where there might be suitable replacements for it. So um, that's that's a website that I would also recommend as well. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, there's another question about working collaboratively with other organizations to do things like material recycling and buying, um, things that may not be as meaningful for smaller organizations, but that could have a much larger impact in bulk. Um, do any of you have experience working with multi-organizational agreements on those types of things? Have you, have you seen it in practice? And uh, do you have any advice on maybe where to begin for someone who's looking to do that? I can start with it. So um, since I'm working with three organizations, but we're also part of um, a ZMD district, which is a zoo museum and, um, and garden district here in St. Louis. And so we have worked across um, the organizations for that. So um, in St. Louis, with addition to our three organizations, there's one art museum, a science center, a zoo and a botanical garden. And we have collectively come together as the ZMD district to try to source um, environmental sustainability items together. And so one of the things that we are trying to collectively come together with, I know this is a large item, but um, EV charging stations, we're rolling out EV charging stations in St. Louis. And so we all have been meeting um, once a month to talk about how we're going to install EV charging stations at our cultural Institution. So I say definitely um, find your counterpart within those different organizations and try to partner to see how you can get one, a bulk rate, and two, um, find a vendor that is local and that will offer you an option for greener options. And um, that's what we do. And um, on the other scale of that, um, the historic houses in DC 
got together in order to share those TerraCycle glove recycling boxes because one historic house didn't have enough to be shipping in, but there was an existing consortium. So they worked together and then um, pool all of their resources. So if you needed to inquire about that, the staff at Dumbarton House would know how to help. Great, thank you. Um, I found it uh, interesting. I'm going to go to the poll real quick on uh, question three of whether, you know, what are the barriers to implementing sustainable practices at your institution? Um, it was kind of awesome to see that four people said that there were no barriers to implementation. So goals, let's just start there. Um, but one of the biggest ones here, I mean, a lot of these financial lack of resources, logistics, staff time, administrative, all seem to be um, pretty large barriers. Uh, but I did have a question because Angela, you mentioned that um, local incentives in terms of like trying to find funding, um, local incentives were one of your favorite uh, kind of places to go to get funding for sustainable practices. And I was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit more. Um, and kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, if you have advice on like where, where people can start looking for, for local places for funding um, in their areas for these types of, of making these types of changes. Yes, that is my favorite source of funding. Um, and the reason being is you can go on to a lot of your um, local energy um, company websites and they will list incentives, but they have a special section for commercial buildings where the incentives are even bigger. Um, and so I will say, reach out to them. I know in Missouri, we have something through Ameren called Biz Savers, and they put a large pot of money into um, this incentive program. And basically they're saying, okay, we need you to improve your building X, Y, Z. And they give you a wide range of ways to do that. And you also get to pick your contractor that you would like to implement that for you. So for example, um, here in St. Louis, EV stations are rolling out, right? And so they're giving organizations 50% incentives to install the green infrastructure to put in um, EV charging stations. And so that's why I say it's my favorite incentives because um, we get to do these projects for half the cost. And sometimes it's even more than 50%. I know our LED lighting project paid for itself plus some. So, I mean, you can implement all LED lights for free. And so definitely look um, at your energy companies for incentives because there are a lot of things that an organization can do practically free because the incentive will, will pay for it. That's awesome. I didn't know about those things, so thank you. And I think a lot of the, um, we did have a question if, if some of the links and names of websites could be placed in the chat, and I believe that is continuing to happen. Um, Angela, there's one more question for you um, specifically in how can um, some of our attendees learn more about zero waste certification and are there any specific institutions or companies that you recommend? So um, we got our zero waste certification through TRUE and TRUE is the acronym for Total Resource Use and Efficiency. And TRUE is under the umbrella of the US Green Building Council. And so that's where we went through our um, zero waste certification from. Um, but I learned about zero waste from, they call him the guru or the grandfather of zero waste. His name is Gary Liss. And if I find his website, I'll put it down there. But he travels the US and he gives seminars about zero waste. So even if an organization did not want to go for a certification, um, his programs show you how to implement a zero waste program um, without a certification. Um, the Missouri Historical Society, we did a certification um, for transparency purposes so that um, people within the uh, community can go in and see exactly what we did to make this um, museum zero waste. Um, but you can implement zero waste without um, a certification. Um, so Zawiya is another <laughs> website um, that you can follow 
for zero waste practices and give a zero waste hierarchy um, that you can follow. And um, I know that William talked about this in his presentation about reuse. That pretty much is the bulk of zero waste, is finding ways to reuse the materials that you already have on site. Um, and so those are just a few sources and hopefully I can um, put those uh, websites in the chat once I, once I stop talking. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Um, we have a, a couple other questions also about um, potential resources that you, you all might know of. Um, and I think actually, Sarah, you mentioned the LCA project, um, and I think that might be a, a big one for some of these things. Um, so one was a question on resources for more sustainable exhibition practices, um, you know, on, on materials that are heavily relied upon for things like wall text, but ultimately that generate a lot of waste. Um, are there alternatives that you know of or uh, ways to reuse these types of materials or recycle them or, um, I don't know, just alternatives for, for trying not to generate so much, so much waste? The, the tool isn't ready on that aspect of it. Uh, so until then, I use uh, greenexhibits.org. So I dropped that link into the chat. Um, Madison Children's Museum led early on um, thinking about how can they create exhibits that's safe for their smallest visitors to climb all over, crawl on, put in their mouths, you know, and came up with safe, more sustainable approaches. So that, that and the resource at the um, Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, I'll see if I can find that link, is the other go-to one until we get um, the NEH tool up, which will be end of end of summertime, probably. Great. Sarah, I have it up. I was going to, okay. to mention it. If you didn't, Thanks. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat box. Thank you. Great. Um, and then I have, I think we're getting closer to three here. So hopefully everyone can see in the chat box a lot of the um, Kind of resources and be able to um, search and, and, and use those. Um, one other question that I have is about um, this idea of, of staff time. Um, as we know, I think a lot of people here are obviously, our attendees are very passionate about sustainability and uh, think about it frequently. Um, but we know that a lot of people don't have sustainability goals kind of worked into their job description. And if they're they're going to be making, you know, trying to make an impact often, um, it has to go beyond what they're already doing and they're short for time. Um, so do you have any advice for people who are trying to uh, work this maybe into, I think Sarah, you talked a lot about this a little bit in terms of leading with your passions and talking about it and, you know, not being guilty when you can't do it all the time because we're short for time. Um, but uh, do you have any other advice on, on trying to make practical steps or maybe lobbying administration um, to get more people to care about this um, and kind of be there with you and working it into your jobs? I would, I'd make notes whenever you can, you know, like you captured resources today, all of us that make sure that those remain available and then share them with somebody else. And when you're making new decisions about purchases and you add that one new green thing this time and one is good enough, put that onto the preferred purchases list. I really do think that shortcut cheat sheet approaches make all the difference in making the next time easier. So even if you find one new thing this month, that's still one new thing, but you need to capture it and share it with somebody else. And if, if I may add on to that, um, although my role is sustainability, um, I was not always employed by the Missouri Historical Society. Before I came here in 2009, it was a staff-led effort. So from all the way from 2009 until I was employed to 2017, it was staff that led the effort. So they had a green committee but then they also had departmental meetings on how to green their department. 
And so maybe start to uh, talk with other staff to figure out how that you guys can work collectively to green um, your space, but also um, advocate for a position. Um, that's how I'm here. You know, the staff at the Missouri Historical Society advocated for um, them to bring on a sustainability professional because it was too much um, to undertake for um, staff on top of their regular role. And so they advocated for that position for many years and then um, it finally became a position. And so definitely um, start small and do small practices um, as employees in your institution, but then advocate for um, a sustainability position to be created. Awesome, that's really cool to hear. Um, and we're hitting up right at three o'clock right now. So uh, I just wanna thank you all for your time um, and wonderful speakers. I learned, I mean, I feel like I'm taking something away from, from every, all of you um, and what you, you've shared today. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, to our participants, please fill out that uh, post webinar survey and give us your feedback. We'll really appreciate it. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers for your generosity. I'm glad to see so many people attend. Extra points for everyone who attended. Good for you for taking time today. That's the example you're setting. Mm -hmm. Good start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh.